a lot of things going on in the life of the church, but this is, this is important. Uh, Saturday, we're going to have a spaghetti dinner, kind of a fellowship and, and fun event down in, the, in Lankford Hall. And then at 6 p.m. on Saturday here in the sanctuary, Casey Armstrong is going to be putting on a, a concert. Uh, it's going to be really good. You don't want to miss uh, either one of those things. So uh, are there any other announcements this morning? Anything I missed? All right. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer as we begin. Father, it's so good to be in your house. Uh, Lord, we're thankful for your presence in this place. Uh, Lord, we just come to center our hearts and minds on you. Lord, mold us, shape us into uh, followers, into disciples. Use us right now. Uh, Lord, just help us to give you our very best in worship. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to stand with me as we sing our opening hymn, All Who Hunger. Join me in our historic profession of our faith, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. I invite our usher forward for the morning offering. Let us pray. Father, we come now to return a tithe and an offering to you. We pray that you would bless these gifts. Multiply them. Bless the giver in Jesus' name.
again for a doxology. Invite our children down for children's time. of people. Does anybody remember that story? Yeah. What did they feed, what did he feed them? Fish and bread. So how many so it's about, so he fed a whole bunch of people and why did he feed a whole bunch of people? Because these people were hungry, right? They were listening to te Jesus' teaching and they were hungry and they didn't have any food and so this little boy s saw that they were talking about it and how many loaves of bread did he have? Five. And how many fish did he have? Two. That's right. How do you think he fed? Was that feed all of us? That, there's a million of us. Would that feed a million of us? How does he do that? They plussed it. They multiplied it. That's right. Yes. Amen. Amen. Yes. We, they added to it. And God provided for all of those people to eat, right? So guess what? We're going to go to Children's Church. We're going to talk about it a little bit, okay? Okay? So let's say a prayer and we'll go to Children's Church. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day and thank you for these children. Lord, help them to go out and multiply. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Good morning. We have several folks that we want to remember in prayer this week. Um, there's some there listed in your bulletin. We want to especially mention the family of Jan Gore. She was very beloved by many in our community, so we'll definitely be in prayer for their family. We also want to pray for Karen Milam, Dale Kiger, Brenda Seaman, Jim Christie, Nick Bluto. Are there others we want to lift up this morning? Yes, sir. The family of Johnny Clore. Let's go to God in prayer today. Oh, Lord, we want to be Christians in our hearts. We want to be more like your disciples, Andrew and Philip, who took the time to invite others to encounter your healing and saving presence. As we think about your disciples, Andrew and Philip, we are mindful of those who need you in this time, Lord. We especially pray for those who are in grief. And we pray for those who have been ill. 
It's the time of year when we're reminded just how interconnected the world is and how easily sickness can spread from person to person. But Lord, we're also reminded that you are the one that we can turn to during these times and even more. We know that you know our struggles. You know our needs. You know our hunger. You are the one who took just five loaves and two fish and fed a multitude of people. Thanks in part to a young boy who was brought to you by Andrew. You were the one who encountered people from the crowd who were brought to you by the disciple Philip. Oh Lord, may we be like Andrew and Philip who invited others into your fold to encounter your healing and saving presence. Sometimes our discipleship involves really simple things, Lord, like doing a little extra cleaning in our church to provide a hospitable environment or making valentines for our homebound members or checking on the well-being of a neighbor, feeding the hungry, participating in Sunday worship, whether it be in person or online. In all these ways and many more, Lord, we are your disciples. We are inviting others to encounter you. And at this time, I just want to invite each one of us to extend our hands in front of us with our, our palms facing upward, like we're receiving a gift. And I just want us to silently offer to Jesus any fears, anxieties, struggles, needs or burdens that we have in this very moment. And as you silently name those concerns, just allow them to be lifted to our gracious and loving Heavenly Father, who is more than able to replace them with peace. And with our palms still extended, I invite us to pray the prayer that his son Jesus invited us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Lord, we believe. We believe. That's what we've been talking about all throughout this series. It's more than just hope. It's more than just wishful thinking. It's believing. It's believing. Eyewitness. We've been journeying with John as he journeyed with Jesus. John was an eyewitness to all that Jesus did, and he's building a case. He's showing us the the signs. He's talking about the miracles, but they were more than just miracles. They were signs that pointed to something greater. They pointed to Jesus' identity as the Messiah, the Son of God. And, And John followed Jesus not because of what he hoped for. He followed Jesus because of what he believed, what he knew. So when I was a kid, my dad traveled a lot. He, he was uh, out of town a lot during the weeks, but he would always come home for the weekend. And a lot of Fridays, he'd come home early, and me and my little sister, we'd run up to him, give him a big hug. And then the first thing out of our mouth was always, what did you bring us? <laughs> you know, it should be, Daddy, oh, we miss you, we love you. No, it was always, what did you bring us? <laughs> and because he was known to bring us some treats and things, but... Occasionally he would forget or didn't have time, and, and he'd say, well, I brought you me. And we'd say, oh, really? Is that all? God, Dad, what did, you, what did you bring us? I brought you me. Oh. Well, fast forward to now, and, you know, I have two little girls, and sometimes I have to be gone overnight, like whether it's preaching a revival or a youth event or a music thing. Uh, occasionally I'm out of town uh, and then I'll come in the door from a trip and my little girls they'll run up to me and give me a big hug and you know what the first thing out of their mouth is dad what'd you bring us <laughs> what did you bring us and, I, and I'll, I'll tell them well girls I, I brought you me and they'll look at me with their little angelic faces and say well well daddy you're all that we ever needed and, and <laughs> And we'll, we'll circle up right there and just have prayer together. No. no. That never happens. That never, that never happens. I mean, in my mind maybe, but I, I brought you me. Really? Is that it? If we're not careful, that's how we will treat our Heavenly Father. If we're not careful, God, what did you bring us? We'll treat God like that divine parent, which he, he is, but we'll always be expecting, God, what, what are you going to bring us? What do you have for us? Early on in our church, on our, in our faith journey, maybe we struggle with that, you know, thinking about, oh, well, how do we get it? How do we get things from God? How do we get God to, to give us things? If you were to write a book about that, how to if you were to write a book, how to get God to give you things, if you were to write a book on that, it would sell millions of copies because people love that. But that's not what it's about at all. We're not getting it. It's not about what we're getting. It's about what we're giving and who we're following, who we're following. Not so much consumers, but followers. That's what we're going to be talking about today because do you know that it is impossible? Do you know that it's impossible to have an authentic relationship with someone that you're always trying to get something from. It's impossible. I'm going to repeat that because it's worth repeating. It's impossible to have an authentic relationship with someone that you're always trying to get something from. And God, our Heavenly Father, He wants us to have an authentic relationship with Him. It's not about all that we get. It's about what we can give and who we are following And so John, who we've been journeying with through the Gospel of John, uh, he tells us that God loves us so much and that he's already given us everything that we've ever needed because he gave us himself. He gave us his only begotten son, Jesus. God showed up. Emmanuel, God is with us. God showed up. And that should make a huge difference. And, and when you, it's one thing to, to get that in our heads, to, to know that in our heads, but to make that difficult one-foot journey to our hearts, that, that's the hardest journey of them all. To, to know it in our heads, but then to believe it in our hearts. That's when the difference comes. That's when we actually, although we don't follow God to get anything, but you do, you get the peace of God which passes all understanding. Paul says it, and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds 
in Christ Jesus. That means, what does that mean to have the peace of Christ in our heart? That means that you can be okay even when things are not okay. It means that you can have peace even in the midst of some chaos. Jesus is all that we've ever needed. That God showed up. And when we understand that, and that goes from our head to our heart, it changes everything. It should give us that, that peace that passes all understanding. Before I say too much, let's stop for a, a word of prayer. And as you pray with me, don't forget to pray for me this morning. Let's pray. Oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts and minds together be found acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So I think we're on oh, about the fourth or fifth, fifth week of our sermon series, Eyewitness. And so we're going to be wrapping that up next week. Uh, so be here next week for uh, the grand finale of Eyewitness. But we've been journeying with John, looking at the Gospel of John. And, and John is, is very clear. He didn't follow Jesus because of what he hoped or what he wished for. He followed Jesus because of what he believed, what he saw with his own eyes. He was, a, he was an eyewitness, and he wrote all this stuff down, and he builds his testimony as to why we should believe. And he gives us all of these accounts, all of these stories, all of these miracles, but they weren't miracles just for the sake of miracles. They were signs, signs that had a, a greater purpose, signs that, that pointed to Jesus' identity. And John, because of what he believed and what he saw with his own eyes, because of the evidence, he followed Jesus and he placed his trust in him. But John, as an old man, as he's writing his gospel and, and he's writing all of this down, he had future generations in mind. He had all these stories. He had been teaching the early church and telling these stories of Jesus, and it finally occurs to him, I better write this stuff down. It needs to be passed on. And so it comes down to us through the gospel, the good news according to John. And, and John's thesis, his big idea, his bottom line, uh, which is our theme verse for this series, we find in John 20, 30, and 31, where John writes, Jesus performed many other signs, and I think I left this one off the slide, so y'all just follow me. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, that's our key word, believing, you may have, what do we get? <laughs> Life in his name. Life in his name. So today we're on the, the fourth sign that we find in the Gospel of John. Uh, are y'all ready for a pop quiz? First sign, this is the easy. First sign, water to wine. That's the easy one. The second one was where Jew, Jesus heals the Jewish official's son, and he does it kind of in abstentia. He says, go home, don't hurry, don't worry, your son will be well. Uh, the third sign, which we talked about last week, Jesus heals the, the man who had been an invalid for 38 years, but he heals him on the Sabbath. And he's in Jerusalem, and the Pharisees get upset about that. They don't celebrate about the healing. They get mad because he, Jesus does it on the, the Sabbath. Today we're going to look at the fourth sign, and I think, uh, I imagine that it's probably the one you're most familiar with, and that is Jesus feeding the 5,000 plus, plus. We're going to get to the plus part. And so Jesus was in Jerusalem. He healed the, the man who had been an invalid for 38 years. And then he travels north to Galilee. And he gets on a boat. And they journey to the northernmost point of the, the Sea of Galilee. And they stop in a, in a really remote area of Galilee. It's a, it's a quiet area, a remote area. Just a place to, to think, a place to reflect, a place for Jesus to recharge his batteries because He's been going pretty hard, and, and Jesus has also received some pretty bad news uh, recently that his cousin John had been beheaded. His cousin John had been killed, and so Jesus was probably grieving. Uh, he, he needed some time to breathe, some time to think. I mean, Jesus was 100% God, but we remember he was also 100% human, and so he needed a little time to kind of take a breath, and I, I completely get that as a, as a pastor, but this is what happens. Um, Jesus doesn't really get the time, that, <laughs> the time to catch his breath. John chapter 6, verse 2. Follow along with me if you have your, your Bibles, or you can follow on the, the screen as well. And a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover festival was near. 
Now, why do they include that detail about the timing? Well, it will explain the crowd's response a little later. And you remember the Passover festival. This was a, a festival that the Jews celebrated every year, a time that they remembered their, the exodus out of Egypt, the time that God delivered them uh, out of Egypt, a time where you know the, the, uh, the angel of death passed over their homes because of the, the blood of the lamb. And so they remember that, but they also remember their story. And they remember Moses telling them that, that God would send a Messiah who would save them. And so they were reminded during this time that they needed another Moses, another Joshua. Verse 5, when Jesus looked up, now granted he's probably trying to have a little downtime, but he sees the crowd coming toward him. And Jesus knew why they were coming. Uh, they wanted something from him. They, they wanted something. Uh, he, at this point, they had become so enamored by the signs themselves. The crowd just couldn't get enough of the miracles. They couldn't get enough of the signs. They wanted more. Jesus, show us some more signs, some more miracles. And so they had become enamored by the signs themselves instead of, the most important part, being enamored by the one that the signs were pointing to in Jesus. He, Jesus, said to Philip with all this crowd, where shall we buy bread for all these people to eat? Now, why did he ask Philip that? Uh, well, Philip was from that area. Philip, that was Philip's home turf. Philip, you're from around here. Where, where are the good places to eat around here? Where can we get some food? And Philip's like, well, uh, there are none. <laughs> there are none. It would kind of be like us. All right, church, we're going to go take a little trip over to Enochville. And, and you say, well, Pastor Will, you're from Enochville. Where, where are all the good eating places in Enochville? And I'll say, well, there are none. <laughs> That was, you know, there, there just were no good eating places around there. There were no places to get food. Verse 6, he, Jesus, asked this to, to Philip only to test him. For he already knew what he had in mind that he was going to do. Verse 7, Philip answered him, it would take more than a half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have just to bite. So Philip's like, oh, we got all these people, we don't have enough food, and if, if, we, if there were somewhere to get food, we don't have enough money to, to feed them, what are we going to do? Verse 8, another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up, well, well here's a boy and with five small barley loaves and two small fish. This was a poor man's meal. We think of a poor man's meal as kind of pintos and cornbread. This was a poor man's meal. Barley and Barley bread and some fish, and probably pickled fish. I know that don't sound too good. Pickled fish or, or salt dried fish. A poor man's meal. How far will they go among so many? Jesus said, well, we'll have the people sit down. And there was plenty of grass in that place, and so they sat down. About 5,000 men were there. So 5,000 men. So maybe 20,000 people. You know, counting the women and the, and the children. 5,000 men, that's the equivalent of an entire Roman legion in the army. 5,000 men. Keep that in mind. Then Jesus took the loaves of bread and he gave thanks. Kind of like we're going to do in communion here in a little while. I'm going to take the bread and, and give thanks. But, but this time it, it's kind of embarrassing. You see, it looks a little ridiculous. The disciples are like, Jesus, what are you doing? You, you see all these people, all these 5,000 people, this, you know, these couple of loaves, this isn't going to feed everybody. What in the world are you doing? It would be like, you know, everybody, the whole church showing up for, uh, for Easter sunrise breakfast down in Langford Hall. And we're expecting some good food. I mean, some grits and bacon and sausage and gravy and biscuits and all that stuff like we normally have. Uh, but, but this year, Dan and his crew, they, they forget to show up to cook breakfast. And everybody's here and we're all hungry and we're all wanting breakfast. And, and Pastor Willie, I go over there and say, oh, I found a bagel. Here we go. And I, I start blessing this bagel. And All right, folks. I mean, you know, let's come eat. It's ridiculous, right? It was, it was almost embarrassing. I'm sure the disciples are like, Jesus, what are you doing? This, this isn't going to feed all these people. What are you doing? But Jesus took the loaves and gave thanks and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. And he did the same with the fish. And when all had, had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. There was an abundance of food. 
There was an abundance. That's where we get our 12 baskets ministry, out of our abundance. You, you remember that the Israelites, they were fed when they were wandering in the, the wilderness. God fed them. God provided for them manna from heaven. But he only gave them just enough for the day, each day. Enough manna from heaven for that day, just enough. But here, Jesus, he has supplied a bounty. He has supplied an abundance, an abundance. Who is this guy? They're wondering, you know, this is, could it be him? Verse 14, after the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. Maybe this is the one Moses was telling us about. The anointed one. Maybe this is the Messiah. And for just one second, they become less enamored by the sign itself. And they understood who the sign was pointing to. For just one second, they understood. And they considered that it was a sign pointing to Jesus' identity as the Messiah. Verse 15. But Jesus, knowing they, that they intended to come and make him king by force. The people are thinking, I mean, why we need a king? I mean, why would they want to make Jesus a king? Well, they, they think back and remember it's the Passover leading up to the Passover. So the story of, of Moses and all that, that's on their mind. And they're thinking, we need another kind of Moses figure to lead us out of this bondage that we're in. You see, back then they were in bondage to Egypt, but now they were in bondage to Rome. Rome was in control and they needed a leader to help lead them out of you know, Roman control. Maybe we need another David. We need someone, you know, this warrior king to help us, you know, march on to Jerusalem. We need someone to help us lead this revolt. Let's, let's make Jesus our king. Hey, we got enough men here. We've got 5,000 men. We've already got enough, you know, essentially a whole Roman legion. Let's go. Let's fight. Let's go to Jerusalem and revolt. That's what was in the minds of the people. Jesus, lead us into the gates of Jerusalem. Let's lead this revolt. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to the mountain by himself. He withdrew. That's not what he was there for. That's not what he was there for. But church, we remember that there would be a day when Jesus would lead his people into Jerusalem. This time it would be on a donkey. And he would go not to be coronated as king, but to be crucified as the Savior. Jesus tells his disciples, go on the other side of the lake. <laughs> I don't want any of this going to your head. Disciples, y'all are already, you know, sometimes you don't get it. You go on to the other side of the lake. I don't want this going to your head. And I'm going to come with you. And Jesus joins the other 12 on the other side of the lake. And the crowd does too, because the they're still following Jesus. They're still wondering, what can we get? Let's see some more signs. But Jesus is about to thin the crowd. He's about to call them out. He's about to step on their toes, and, and us too. Have you ever heard anybody say something like this in church, like, or maybe outside of church? Well, you know, I, I just gave up on church because I wasn't getting anything out of it. Have you ever heard anybody say that? And I just wasn't being fed. Sometimes they say it that way. I just gave up on church. I gave up on my faith. I wasn't getting anything out of it. Well, the point that Jesus is about to make is that as, as long as we're always, as, as we're thinking about just getting what we want, as long as we're just looking for what we can get, then we hadn't got it. Then we're just like those kids who rush to the Lord, Daddy, what'd you bring us? Are we just in it for what we can get? Are we just consumers? Or are we followers? Verse 25, Jesus is going to step on their toes here. The crowd, when they found him on the other side of the lake, they ask him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus probably shakes his head and he, he gets right to the point. He's fussing at him here. He says, you are looking for me, not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. He's telling them, you, you've missed it. I mean, there for a moment you had it, but then you missed it. You missed the, the sign. He says, do not work for, in, order, in other words, don't live for, don't give your life to, don't think about, do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, 
which the Son of Man will give you. Jesus is saying, I've got everything you need. Do you not realize what I'm offering? Do you not realize who I am? I am the Son of God. And all you can think about is your stomach. All you can think about is lunch. And the crowd, they're still not getting it. Verse 30, well, what sign then will you give us? They're so used to getting a sign. Jesus, just show us a sign. Let's do a miracle. What sign, the crowd says, what sign then will you give us that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? What will you do? They're all about Jesus. What can we get? What will you do? And then this example popped into their head because, again, they're thinking about the Passover. Our ancestors ate manna in the wilderness. Again, they're talking. They must have been hungry. I mean, they just wanted Jesus to provide some more food. Back to back to lunch. Good grief. But here they are, standing on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, in the presence of the light of the world. Jesus Himself, God in a body, and they miss it. They miss it. They couldn't see past their own stomachs. And at this point, many of them chose to unfollow Jesus. They chose to unfollow him because. The show was over in their minds. They had come to get something, but Jesus says no. The show was over. The church, for us, I want us to think on this side of the resurrection, knowing that what we know now, are we just in it for the food? Are we just in it for what we can get out of it? Are we just here to consume, or are we here to follow? We have been invited to follow. We've been invited to follow Jesus, to be a disciple, to be a part of his church, his big C church, the church universal. And guess what? The church universal has done some tremendous, tremendous things. Don't forget that. I know the church gets a lot of bad publicity these days, but the, the church is powerful. The church has done so much good, so much to shape the world, so much to shape, particularly Western civilization. This is no small thing that we've been asked to do. It's no small thing to be invited to follow Jesus. This is not a small thing. This is a huge thing that we've been invited to do. I mean, let's think about it. If every one of us, for just maybe just a week, if we were to love as Jesus loved for just a week, if we were to just forgive as Jesus forgave for just a week, can you imagine if all of us did that? What an impact. I mean, it would be felt around the world. The question is not, what can we get out of it? The question is, what can we give? Who can we serve? Who can we follow? And then the most important question Jesus asked, who do you believe I am? Who do you believe I am? A lot of people in the crowd that day, they just saw Jesus as some kind of magic rabbi. And they lost interest after the show. But a few recognized the truth that he was God in disguise. And they ask for nothing. They ask for nothing. They just followed. And in the end, Jesus gave them more than they could ever imagine. He gave them himself. Himself. All they ever needed. Church, I hope that you're not just in this for lunch and a show. I hope you're not just in this for what you can, can get. If so, you're, you're going to miss the point. You're going to miss the adventure. You're going to miss your Savior. You see, it's impossible, as I said to begin with, it's impossible to have an authentic relationship with someone you're always trying to get something from. So stop negotiating. Just, just say yes. Just wake up every morning. I challenge you to do this. Wake up every morning and say, God, here I am. Use me. God, teach me. Counsel me. Lord, show me what you'd have me to do. I want to follow you. God, thy will be done. Not my will be done, but thy will be done. Church, in light of Calvary, in light of all that we know, this is how we should answer it. Not, Lord, what did you bring me? We don't need to be like those kids that run to the door. What, what, what do you have for us? What, what did you bring us? No, Lord, how can we serve you? How can we follow you? John tells us in his gospel that God has already given us everything that we needed. The most important thing. John 20, verse 31, he says, These things are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. When that's enough, 
to know that, you know what, I have life in Jesus' name. When you believe that, and that goes from your head to your heart, the adventure begins. Until then, if, if you're still just in it for what God, what God, what can you give us? You've reduced God, the, the God of the universe, down to the significance of a, of a food truck with all the wrong things in the menu. You'll find yourself negotiating with the God of all creation. Let's not be consumers. Let's be followers. And let's leave our mark. Let's leave our mark. The mark of Jesus on this world. The followers of, the Je- of Jesus, they, they changed the world once. And perhaps we can do that again. And it's not just hope. It's not just wishful thinking. It is believing, knowing that God is, that Jesus is the Son of God. And that by believing we have life in his name. When that goes from here to here, from head to heart, that also we do get something. We get the peace of God, which passes all understanding. Which means you can be okay, even when things aren't okay. It means you can have peace, even in the midst of the chaos. We realize that God loved us so much. That he sent his son into the world for us. That he gave us everything we've ever needed. Don't miss it next week. We're going to wrap this thing up. Eyewitness. We're going to continue journeying with John as he journeyed with Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for uh, just your word. Uh, Lord, we thank you for John who did the, the painstaking work of writing this all down so that us, future generations, may come to know you, and not just to, to know you, to believe in you and have life in your name. Lord, forgive us for times when we have been consumers, for times when we've just been thinking about us and what we can get. Lord, help us to just to surrender to you, to follow you, to serve you, Lord, to change this world for you. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to invite those that will be helping with communion to, to come forward. In our church, we celebrate communion typically on the first Sunday of each month, and this is a time for us to remember our story, our our most important story of how Jesus came, his body was broken for us, and his blood was shed for us. Uh, This is a time that we open the altar, a time that we we pray, we recommit ourselves to to Jesus. And in our church, this uh, this is the Lord's table. This is not our table, and all are invited to partake in the Lord's Supper. We remember that on the night in which Jesus gave himself up for us, he took bread and he broke the bread and he gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body, which has been broken for you. And after the supper was over, Jesus took the cup and he gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith, knowing that Christ has died, Christ has risen, and Christ will come again. Let us pray. Oh God, I pray that you would pour out your Holy Spirit on these gifts of bread and wine. Lord, make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ, that we might be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by your blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ and one with each other and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your son, Jesus Christ, with your Holy Spirit and your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. This morning we'll receive communion by intention, which means that I will break off some bread and place it in your hands, the body of Christ broken for you. And you're invited to take that bread and dip it into the cup. The body of Christ broken for you. The body of Christ broken for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. The blood of Christ shed for you.
the table's been set. Let us come and enjoy the Lord's Supper. We also have some uh, gluten-free bread down here if you need that. I invite you to come down the center aisles and then return to your seat on the outside aisles. serve Bobby.
Let's stand together as we sing our closing hymn. say, Lord, God, what did you, what do you got for us? What did you give us? And we'll say, Lord, we're going to, we're going to go out and live and seek and follow you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.